Indoor golf simulators are a great way to get a little exercise, improve your game, and have fun with your friends. And while they used to be insanely expensive, new launch monitors and falling projector prices have made them significantly more affordable. So I'm gonna run you through each of the key parts of my DIY home simulator and show you how I built them, how much they cost, how long they took me, and I'll definitely point out all the mistakes that I made along the way. As always, there are no sponsored reviews on this channel, and I paid full price for everything you're about to see. The first thing that you need for a simulator is a room to put it in. In Florida, we don't have basements, so the garage was my only real option. As for dimensions, to comfortably swing a golf club without needing to offset your screen, you're going to need about 12 feet of width, and depending on which launch monitor you choose, you'll need between 10 and 18 feet of total length. More on that later. However, the area where you're most likely going to run into an issue is with ceiling height. I am six foot one, so my eight and a half foot garage ceiling made it impossible for me to swing any club longer than a seven iron without smashing it into the ceiling. In my case, above most of my garage was just an attic space and a roof, so vaulting the ceiling was a possibility. I contacted four different local engineering firms about the project, and I got quotes ranging from $1,000 for just the truss modification engineering plans to over $35,000 for a full service engineering and contracting firm who was going to take care of the whole ceiling project. Now, $35,000 was way out of my budget, so with a set of engineering plans in hand and the help of my extremely handy brother-in-law, I was able to modify four trusses giving me 10 feet of vaulted roof space in the middle of my garage. The actual truss modifications took about 13 hours for me and my brother-in-law, and the materials were $350, which was mostly southern yellow pine 2x8s, plywood, and a giant box of 3-inch framing nails. I also rented a battery-powered nail gun from Home Depot, which was $50 for a 24-hour rental. After that, I spent two 10-hour days cleaning up wiring, doing some additional framing for the new attic spaces, pre-wiring for the simulator screen and projector, and insulating both the new garage ceiling and the garage door. Once all that was done, all that was left was drywall, so I hopped on Craigslist and sent about 20 text messages to tradesmen advertising drywall services, because screw drywall. I got a quote for $1,200, which was well worth it in my opinion, because again, screw drywall. So at this point, there was no simulator in sight and I was already about $3,000 and 40 man hours deep. So hopefully your ceilings are already tall enough, but just know that if they aren't, it is possible to raise them. The next most important part about a simulator build is selecting a launch monitor, which is the thing that actually watches your club and ball and figures out where and how far you hit it. And there are basically two ways to do that. You can use radar or you can use cameras. Camera-based monitors like the Unicore i-Series are permanently ceiling mounted, but they were unfortunately way out of my budget, while more affordable options like the SkyTrack, Bushnell Launch Pro, and Foresight GC2 all get placed next to the ball. And the good part about putting your monitor right next to your ball is that there isn't any minimum distance behind or in front of the ball, so your room can be a lot smaller. But for a temporary setup, the downside is needing to set up and align and configure the monitor every time you want to play. Radar-based systems, on the other hand, need to be set up behind you, and most require at least 8 feet in between your monitor and the hitting area. They also need a decent amount of space to watch the ball's flight path, so they require 8 feet from the hitting area to the screen. So 16 feet from wall to screen is the real sweet spot, and my garage space was just long enough. Aside from the $19,000 TrackMan, the two most popular radar-based systems are the Garmin R10 and the FlightScope Mevo Plus. And between the two, the general consensus is that the R10 is more of a toy, while the Mevo Plus is more of a tool. So I coughed up the additional $1,000 and I got the Mevo Plus. Because my setup is going to be in the exact same place every time, I was able to 3D print a wall mount for my Mevo Plus that ensures it's always going to be in the perfect place and at the perfect angle for my setup without needing to recalibrate it every time I want to play. And even though I technically could have used a camera-based system with how my system finally ended up, I still don't have any regrets about choosing the Mevo Plus. So moving on to the impact screen. Impact screens are not the same as normal projector screens. Not only are they thick and tough, but they also have reinforced grommets around the outside to get the exact correct screen tension. You're going to be hitting balls going well over 100 miles an hour from 8 feet away, so it's going to take some real punishment. And from what I've seen, the cheap ones on Amazon are basically just heavy sheets, and they won't hold up. When it comes to temporary setups, the most common solution is to use three roller bars, one for the main impact screen and then two for side protection. Unfortunately, a major limitation of roll-up screens is that they tend to be significantly lighter and thinner than fixed screens, which means louder impact and less longevity. Also, balls can hit the metal roller on the top, and they can easily sneak between the side protection and the impact screen, so most vendors suggest putting in padded Velcro connections in between the front and sides, which is an extra part to store and an extra step in the setup, which requires a step ladder. I am a bit of a home automation nerd, and a really common saying is that an automator will spend a full 40-hour week automating something just to save 5 minutes, and that is exactly what happened here. 
So instead of using roller screens that would need a few minutes of additional setup every time, I decided to fold an entire fixed screen into my new vaulted ceiling. I have a tendency to overbuild everything, so I decided on 1x3 steel tubing for the frame of the screen, which I mitered and welded in the corners, and then I added 1 inch flat stock bracing to give it some additional lateral strength. I am basically a hobbyist welder, but 14 gauge low carbon steel is very forgiving and is pretty hard to mess up. I also way overbuilt the hinge mechanism, which consists of 1 inch cold rolled steel bars that rotate inside of 1 inch pillow block bearings that are rated for over 3,000 pounds of dynamic load. Fully constructed, the screen, turf, and frame together weigh around 300 pounds, so the hinges are at less than 10% of their maximum load. But I also needed a hoist to raise it to the ceiling. So in the spirit of overbuilding everything, I used a 440 pound capacity wireless hoist from Amazon, which is mounted to 12 gauge Unistrut lag bolted directly to the trusses. Even though everything is way under 50% capacity, I also installed a safety system using linear rails and bearings that can support the weight of the screen in the event of a hoist failure of some kind. Cost for the screen frame, hoist, and safety mechanism was $550, and total build time was around eight hours. Because everything was custom built, I could maximize the space, and I ended up with less than an inch of clearance on either side of the screen, and about a quarter inch of clearance from the screen frame to the floor, which is actually a mistake, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. My custom dimensions also meant that the screen needed to be a very specific size, and thankfully the impact screen manufacturer that I was already planning on using does custom screen sizes for no additional cost. So I was able to order the premium impact screen from Carl's Place in my exact dimensions with grommets, flaps, and Velcro for $595, which seemed totally reasonable to me, especially since their main selling point of the premium screen material is increased sound dampening, which is definitely important in my garage space. To tension the screen, I used a mixture of nine inch and 11 inch bungee cords through the pre-installed grommets. And tensioning an impact screen is a little bit of a balancing act, because the more tension you have, the better the projected image will look, but high tension screens cause golf balls to bounce back significantly more. So I've gradually had to reduce the tension over time. Side netting was also very important to me, since kids and adults of all skill levels are going to be playing on this simulator. The top and side nets are from Amazon and were $40 each, and I attached them together with zip ties every few inches on the top. The side nets work perfectly and can stop any shank or mishit, while the top net mostly works to slow down balls that would normally hit the ceiling and direct them towards the screen, but it doesn't completely prevent contact with the drywall. Since the whole screen folds up into the vaulted area, it was also simple to attach the netting to the sides of the vaulted space with a few screws and washers. And because I got the Carl's Play screen with flaps and Velcro, I could just use some non-adhesive backed one inch Velcro to make a sealed connection between the netting and the impact screen. And that prevents any balls from going to the sides, above, or under the screen. When the screen is down, I attach a sandbag to a carabiner on the end of the net to weigh it down, and when it's time to put the screen up, I attach those carabiners to the opposite sides of the net, which stops the net from drooping down over the sides of the screen and getting trapped between the frame and the vaulted wall space. Speaking of which, remember how I said it was a mistake to have such small tolerances on each side of the screen? I had originally thought that the netting in Velcro would be enough to stop a poorly hit ball from hitting the steel screen frame and ricocheting around the room like a pinball. But after playing with two 10 year olds, I figured out that that was definitely not correct and that I needed to add padding to the frame. I used some cheap pipe insulation which worked surprisingly well and I had just enough room on the sides for the extra padding to fold up into the ceiling. But the bottom of the frame was too close to the floor to fit any insulation, so I had to screw some scrap wood to the top of the metal frame to be able to add the foam along the bottom. Total cost of the safety nets and foam padding was around $180, but it was definitely money well spent. Now, moving on to my biggest regret, the True Strike Golf Mat. When I was originally dreaming up this project, I had envisioned a rigid hitting mat that I could pick up and rest against the wall when not in use. The True Strike mat is fine when laying on the floor, but it is a floppy mess when you try to lift it. I even tried screwing each piece together, both horizontally and vertically on the joints, but the mat was still an 80 pound floppy nightmare to move around. And I decided that storing it on the side of the garage wasn't gonna be an option. Unfortunately, because hitting mats are so heavy, returning them isn't really an option, since return shipping would have cost a quarter of the initial purchase price, and on top of that, Carl's Place charges a 15% restocking fee to cover their shipping costs. So I would have been out almost $500 by switching mats. So my next plan was to raise the entire True Strike mat into the ceiling space. It is possible to use a single hoist and pulleys to have multiple lifting hooks, but unfortunately you have to have a lot of travel distance for that solution to work. So the simplest option for me was just to use two hoists. I built a frame out of one inch steel tubing and one inch flat stock, and I welded lifting shoulder eye bolts rated for 2,400 pounds to each side. I used two smaller hoists rated for 220 pounds single line or 440 pounds doubled up, and I mounted them to another piece of Unistrut. 
I ended up doubling them up, not for lifting capacity, but to reduce their speed, since lifting at full speed caused the hitting mat to bounce and flex. Even though it wasn't my first choice, the lifting mechanism works extremely well, and results in the hitting mat being in the exact same location every time. The only thing that I haven't figured out is a way to add an additional safety mechanism in case one of the hoists were to fail when it was lifted overhead. Let me know down in the comments if you've got any ideas. Total cost for the hitting mat and hoist solution was $1,550, which is way too much, and I would have ended up with a much better overall solution if I had just gone with the Carl's Place mat and divot strip from the beginning. So don't replicate this part. The other issue caused by the True Strike mat is that any putting strip needs to be raised approximately two inches off the ground to be in line with the mat. I used readily available putting turf from Home Depot that came in eight foot widths and any custom length for a cost of $12 per linear foot. I used a 10 foot section in front of the screen to stop the balls from bouncing off the concrete floor. And then using some styrofoam and quarter inch plywood, I built two small runways behind and in front of the mat for putting. The Mevo Plus is notoriously tricky to putt with, but I've had pretty good success by setting up my putting distance to three feet from the Mevo and using this 12 foot runway. I painted a small square on the turf where putts should be started and another small square 10 feet from the first one to help gauge distance. Cost for the turf and putting strip was $196. And the last thing that every screen-based simulator needs is a projector. And I've got some possibly unpopular opinions about this one. On golf simulator forums and Facebook groups, I constantly see people posting about using ultra high-end 4K laser projectors in their simulators, which of course then requires a high-end gaming PC to output those graphics. It would be easy to spend between seven and $10,000 on just the projector and gaming PC alone, but ultimately you're projecting onto a coarsely textured impact screen that isn't fully tensioned and is eventually gonna get dirty and deformed. So if you're looking for an area to save money, the computer and projector are a great place to start. I'm using a BenQ TH671ST short throw projector, which I've had for years and it cost me around $700. It is a 1080p ball projector, so brightness and colors will degrade over time, but while you could easily put 3,000 hours on a TV replacement projector over the course of a year, it would be quite a feat to log 3,000 yearly hours in a golf simulator. For the computer, I'm using an older Dell Voster that a friend of mine in IT gave me for free, but similar PCs are available on eBay for around $250. This computer will absolutely not handle 4K resolution on ultra high settings, but 1280 by 1024 medium settings works just fine. If you're my age, you might also remember that resolution from old CRT monitors and know that it is a 4 by 3 aspect ratio instead of the much more common 16 by 9 resolutions. I see a lot of people playing golf simulators with huge black bars on the top and bottom of the screen just so they can use standard widescreen resolutions. But to me, that seems like a mistake, and I'd personally rather fill more of the screen and run a 4 by 3 ratio. The simulator software that I'm using is GS Pro, which is sort of the young underdog of the simulator world and is not only less expensive than all the alternatives, but it also has the best course selection, since instead of producing their own courses and gatekeeping them with a subscription, they released a course building tool and rely on the GS Pro community to build new courses. As I said, I already own the projector and the computer was free, so my total cost was just the GS Pro software, but you could get a similar setup for around $1,200. So at this point, I'd spent $8,375 to raise the ceiling, build the simulator, and get it all up and running. But there were a few more things that I wanted to add to make things feel a little bit cooler. Starting in the most literal sense, playing golf in the garage in Florida means that you need air conditioning. And I installed a 18,000 BTU mini split from Coopers and Hunter, which cost a total of $1,482, and it was actually pretty hard work to install. It took me around seven hours over two days to get everything mounted, run the electrical, run the cooling lines, and get everything looking nice. And even though I did save about $4,500 by installing it myself, it was one of the more difficult parts of the project. When I posted my preliminary setup on Reddit, somebody commented that every good golf simulator needs a bar, and I agreed. So I built what I would call a Murphy bar, which tucks up out of the way when not in use, but provides a good spot for a couple of spectators and a place to set down your drink. I also happen to have an extra Bartesian cocktail machine right now, so this one gets to live in the garage bar. Total cost for the DIY Murphy bar and stools was just over $150, and build time was about two hours. Last, I used a few smart home products to give the simulator a little bit of flair and make things a little bit safer and a little bit easier. My garage came with a single light and single switch, but that was wildly insufficient for everything that I want to do in my garage. So instead of going through the hassle of pulling more circuits back to the switch, I just installed this three-button Zigbee switch from Zemismart. The top button operates the original switch circuit connected to the first bank of LED shop lights. The second button is synced via Home Assistant to four Shelly Wi-Fi bulbs above the simulator, 
which I keep around 30% brightness so they don't wash out the projector screen. The second switch is also tied to a smart plug that's attached to my garage door opener, and whenever the simulator lights are on, the garage door plug turns off, which prevents anyone from accidentally opening the garage door while the simulator screen is down, which would be a disaster both for the screen and the door. And the last switch is just synced via Home Assistant to another smart plug that controls the last bank of LED shop lights. So with one switch circuit, I can virtually control three banks of lights, which is pretty handy. Another thing that I'm using Home Assistant for is to get easy access to some common hotkeys in GS Pro. I'm using the Haas Agent Windows program in conjunction with a $25 four button battery powered Zigbee switch to send button presses for the left and right arrow keys for aiming, the B key that removes obstacles that are blocking your view, and of course Control M which is the mulligan key in GS Pro. The buttons are big enough to press with your golf club without bending down, and this solution was significantly smaller, cheaper, and more flexible than the off the shelf simulator control boxes. I also 3D printed a surround for it so it would fit in this weird cutout on the back of the True Strike mat that I wish wasn't there. Speaking of 3D printed, I also 3D printed some accessories for my Rubbermaid Fast Track rail system, which I mostly hate. The overall system works great, but each hook and accessory is ridiculously expensive, like they want $25 for this 15 inch black plastic bin. Thankfully someone on Thingiverse modeled the connection hook so you can just stick it on anything that you want now. I made some cup holders, a basket for tees, and a small shelf for about $5 in plastic. I probably could have also printed the rack for my golf clubs, but I ended up just buying a wall mount meant for fishing poles, which does a great job holding my clubs and my daughter's clubs for easy access. The last thing that I bought was this $25 ball tube, not only to store the Pro V1 RCT balls between rounds, but also to make picking them up from the hitting area a lot easier. This is definitely one of the best purchases that I've made, and it not only speeds up my rounds, but it also saves my back. So drum roll please. This golf simulator garage transformation cost me a total of $10,177, which is definitely not a budget build, but it did include structural ceiling modifications, insulation, air conditioning, and of course all the materials and equipment required to stow the entire simulator when not in use. As I mentioned, nothing in this video is sponsored and I bought everything with my own money, but with that said, I am an Amazon affiliate, so if you saw anything that you liked in this video, I've put links for basically everything down in the description, and if you use those links, I do earn a small commission on the sale at no cost to you. If there is a significant interest in this video, I may do a follow-up on the simulator, but otherwise, thanks for indulging me by watching content that's only loosely related to my channel. I did do a massive amount of research before selecting all of my golf sim gear, so if you've got any other questions, feel free to ask them down in the comments and I will try to help out however I can. Thank you so much to my awesome patrons over at Patreon for your continued support on my channel, and if you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out the links down in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button and consider subscribing. And as always, thanks for watching The Hookup.